Now let me introduce my guest. She has been in the industry for two decades. She's America's favorite MILF. She's been highly requested by you guys, and I have finally brought her to you, the one and only Corey Chase. Hi, Corey. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing very good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for coming. I know we've been back and forth about this for a while, so I'm finally glad that we were able to sit down. Yes, so, uh, um, COVID happened and it, it's, been, it's been tough trying to get our schedules to match. I know, right. How did COVID change? Like, I mean, you know, I feel like COVID changed everybody's life. Um, how did COVID impact you specifically? Uh, me, uh, it found, I found out a lot that I, I was able to stay home maybe a little bit more. I didn't really necessarily have to go out and do a lot of crazy things and like travel as much as I thought I was doing. So that definitely helped. Um, and of course, uh, when you're stuck at home, what is the one thing you're going to do, but masturbate and have fun and find new fetishes. So like, it just, it was amazing for me. COVID was a godsend. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. I feel like, you know, most people wouldn't say this, but I feel like a lot of people in the adult industry, performers specifically feel the same way because yeah, it was this opportunity to realize that you could actually survive pretty much on your own financially through, you know, the personal content platforms like OnlyFans, et cetera. And um, it definitely changed the adult industry completely. Do you feel, do you prefer the way things are now where you can produce more content at home and shoot less for studios? Um, yes and no. Uh, I, I like that girls are have this um, way of making money on their own and not having rely on production companies. But then it's kind of degraded uh, porn a little bit. Um, it's become a little bit more disposable and people aren't really expecting a whole lot of like production work when it comes to porn because they're watching it and then they move on to something else, which this was a trend that was happening even before COVID. Uh, but like, I've noticed that even the, the stuff that I'm maybe putting more time in, I have uh, more stars that they're just not appreciating the work that I'm putting into what I'm producing. Um, th that has kind of been a little like, darn, <laughs> like why, why couldn't we also go back to how it used to be? Too? Yeah. I, I relate to that so much. I put a lot of work into the, like the stuff that I shoot for hollyrandall.com. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's, pretty much all solo girl stuff, but you know, before like that got a lot more traction than it does now. And yeah, it's like, people are just like, Oh no, I'd rather see, you know, cell phone footage of low jobs than like all this money that I pour into this, like carefully curated, beautifully shot video and stills. And I get like almost no feedback from it. And it's so disappointing. It's so disappointing. Yeah. So I, um, I feel that pain but you are still shooting for studios sometimes like you were just out here. Um, yes. and so what's that like being back on set? Like, what do you love about being on set versus shooting at home? Um, on set, I like that I can just be the model. I can focus on doing what I need to do with what they've given me. Um, it, it kind of clears me to kind of, be a little, maybe a little more adventurous where, whereas when I'm producing my own content, um, I'm focused on lighting. I'm focusing on set and is the models okay with everything that's going on and all the other stuff, post-production, pre-production that goes on with producing a film that when I work for somebody else, I can just be whoever I want to be for that scene. And it's, it's very kind of refreshing and kind of a helps kind of like reset me where I can maybe even explore a different character or a different scenario 
in what I shoot when I go back home. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. There's a lot of responsibilities that come along with producing your own content as much as like, there may be the benefits of having the control and that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. So I absolutely relate to that. Um, so I guess let's get your origin story. How did you get started in the adult industry? My origin story is very, very long. Um, so there's an unofficial date and an official date and a semi full-time date. So we'll just kind of start from the beginning. Uh, I was modeling uh, for some extra income while I was in college because I was going to college. I was in the National Guard. I was just getting my GI Bill. I was working. I was just like being a pet sitter and everything. And I'm like, oh, I'll do some modeling. I did a lot of like conventions because I was living in Orlando at the time. Conventions and I was just doing like local uh, clothing modeling, like just body part torsos and things like that. And I was a booth girl out at Daytona for the races, for multiple companies. And then my husband, now boyfriend at the time, liked recording ourselves having sex together. I found out that I got turned on by the act of one being recorded. And then later on, once I guess the internet kind of um, exploded and, and the technology caught up. Uh, we could post those little like home sex videos. And I got turned on even more knowing that other people were watching me. So that is kind of my origin story, if you will. But we, we and Zin, my husband and I, we've always kind of made our own content. And then in like 2005, I think it was, I shot my first scene uh, for a mainstream porn company, Reality Kings. And it took a couple of years for it to go live and be activated, if you will. <laughs> um, and uh, I was already a paramedic. I was still in the military, um, in the National Guard. And everybody seemed kind of cool with it. Now, I, I tried to keep myself very professional um, in my work, and I never crossed over. I never did any of the, the production or sex or even answering emails when I was at work. So I tried to separate everything and have these two different lives. But then in 2009, um, that's when both my husband and I, we kind of just parted ways with our real jobs and started doing this full time. And it was definitely an eye opener of how much work took into uh, living off of this stuff and like trying to make a living off of this stuff. It, it was it was a lot of hustle for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Once you become, you know you run your own business, you can't rely on like a, const a consistent salary from a nine to five or whatnot. So there's something, I mean, I could never have a nine to five. My husband has kind of like a nine to five and, and like the job security that he has, though at times it sounds nice. I'm always like, I like the, I like the hustle. And I also like the idea that like I could make significantly more in one month, but then you know, not that much the next month. I obviously don't like the next month, but I just, I don't know. I like that. Like, I feel like there's more opportunity and, and options to kind of rise above. Um, so yeah, I, I totally relate to that. So tell me a little bit about being in the national guard. Um, what does that actually specifically mean there? I have a big audience that's outside of America, so they might need a little bit of explanation there. Um, I signed up my senior year of high school, went right out of high school and went into basic training and AIT, which is known as like their school. So you learn how to do the job that you're being hired for. So I, I went in, did my eight weeks 
basic training, and then I went off to my school. I became a cook in the army. Uh, learned how to cook. I was also doing some catering and s- stuff beforehand when I was in high school. Worked for a catering company. Um, so a lot of the stuff I had already known and it was cool, but I wanted to move over to the medical field and become a paramedic. That was like one of my dreams. It's very complicated, different levels of military. So in the National Guard, you go one weekend a month and then two weeks out of the year, you are activated to do field training usually. Uh, We were an air defense artillery unit, so we shot down missiles, planes, helicopters, drones, things of that nature. Anything that was flying in the air, we took down. Uh, And we practiced every single month. And then two weeks, we would do it out in the field, if you will, reenactments, um, virtual reality, as much as virtual reality was available back then. Uh, and, uh, I was part of the headquarters. So we provided the support for the unit that I was attached to. Right. And were you working as a medic at that time? I was still a cook in the army, but I had, um, gone to school with my GI bill and I got my, uh, paramedic, uh, certificate, a national certificate. And I was trying to work. Uh, with the National Guard to either get a dual MOS or um, just get into another unit to where I could swap over and have a different skill set. One, because I I was trying to get my promotions. Uh, It's very hard, especially for a female to get promotions back in that day um, Mm -hmm. for an infantry unit, because that's what we were. And as a paramedic, I mean, I had a friend who was a paramedic and they just saw like some crazy shit. And I just, did you, like, how, how was that? Like, did you see some crazy kinds of like death and violence and how did you manage that? And did it take any getting used to? Uh, I I managed it fairly well. Uh, Nothing really super duper like affected me and like really made me um, like sit back and think like, what am I doing? Like, I, I can't handle this. I always looked at every call that I had because they, they teach this to you in school too. Uh, when you're becoming a paramedic, you have a situation and you need to come up with five diagnoses for the person that you're dealing with. So you have the actual one and then other ones that it could possibly be ranging from not very bad to the worst. So you've already kind of painted this big picture of this person that you're taking care of. And I like to put it as it was a puzzle. So it's this puzzle that it's all just strewed on the table or on my gurney. And I was putting those pieces of the puzzle back together and making it a beautiful picture. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that I saw, a lot of the, the violence from gangs and kids in Orlando to um, the pregnant women that I was transporting because they were having some sort of reaction to something or um, all different kinds of things like brain cancers and heart problems and, and organ transplant patients that I was, I even transported an organ, just an organ themselves. So it like, it just, it was a picture and I knew that I was trying to make it a bigger and better picture and a more beautiful painting. So I I always, and I still try to do this in my everyday life, like look at the big picture, think positively about things. And if you do, that's what you're going to see. And that negative isn't going to like penetrate you and like take you over and 
and cause that depression. Okay. I see what you mean. So you're kind of, you're really looking at it as a job and you're taking it step by step and you're looking at all Mm -hmm. of the pieces that you need to put together to do your job rather than I'm just, cause I'm like, I have um, like a huge fear of death. And all that kind of stuff. So like, I, I just feel my sister's a nurse and, you know, she's seen people die many times, like right in front of her. And I've like never experienced that. And I just can't imagine ever being able to experience that. So I'm always so curious about people who see that on a daily basis and, and how they manage that, because I feel like I would internalize that so much and I would take that home. And, you know, sometimes I lay in bed at night and think about like, how am I going to die and what's going to happen? And like, what happens after you die? And what am I going to do with this person dies? It's like, it's a terrible thing. It's a problem yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm always I, curious I like as the, to how people handle that. I, I always thought like the, the death part of it, it's, it's a little unsettling, especially when it is very sudden. Um, I dealt with a lot of hospice patients. So a lot of their deaths, like it was something that was, of a finish that they're actually finally finding peace. Um, the kids, the young children, I always like to think that maybe possibly something bad was going to happen to them soon. And that this kind of kept them from experiencing experiencing something that was horrible. And there are so many horrible things going on in this world that, you become um, kind of introduced to in in that line of business that you can kind of set yourself aside and see that, okay, this child that might have lost their life from a motor vehicle accident might have been in some sort of situation later on in life and it kind of helped them keep them from doing that. They keep their innocence, if, if you will. That's an interesting take. So it's kind of like this idea of, I don't know if I, if you want to call it. That they're going to a better place. They're always going to a better place. Do you believe in like the afterlife? Like, what do you think happens when you die? This is a random turn for a porn Uh podcast to take, but like, since we're on the subject, Um, like. mm -hmm. I, I believe that there is something I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's maybe a manifestation of ourselves or if it's some huge thing where we can go back and be with the people that we loved um, or if it's just nothingness. But in a way, if it is just nothingness, then wouldn't it want to make your living your life here as good as you want it. So I, I always try to teeter on that line of, of I'm going somewhere cool, but you know what? I'm going to live my life here just as well as I could possibly live it there just in case if nothing happens later on. Right. As opposed to like people who, you know, I mean, obviously this, this really plays out in religion, but people who deny themselves all kinds of pleasure and live these like kind of really strict Calvinistic lifestyles because they Mm -hmm. think that they're going to have this marvelous afterlife afterwards. And I always, you know, think to myself like, man, like what if you're wrong and like, you don't get that and you wasted your life. But then I'm like, what if I'm wrong and there is an afterlife and then I don't get to go because <laughs> I'm doing like all this shady shit in my regular life. And I guess like ultimately, I mean, we'll never know. Right. And there's probably some comfort that people must get. There, there's got to be like an enormous amount of comfort from people who believe in the afterlife and believe that they're going to heaven afterwards. I feel like that in itself is a kind of a reward to have really have that faith. I don't know. But the, the, there's this faith and then there's this thing of like you you're not being able to enjoy this world, this life right now that you're living in in this moment because you're waiting for something in the future. Yeah, exactly. You're waiting like, for what, this what better thing. And then 
well, if I have to be this pure person now, then what is that better place? Like, what are you going to be able to do in that better place that's going to be amazing? Yeah, it's that like you if you can't have struggle so many times right. in the here and now. Yeah, like if you can't have orgies now, are you going to be able to have them later in the afterlife? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> do those thoughts just disappear? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's crazy, right? It's like, I don't know. So, Corey, moving away from the afterlife, death, and the meaning of life. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you specialize in, you do a lot of those um, stepmom faux-cest roles, which are enormously popular, which pretty much we all shoot. Just, um, mm -hmm. There's kind of a divide among performers whether or not they're comfortable shooting those kinds of scenes. I will say... Personally, at first, I was like, I don't want to shoot those kinds of scenes. And then when it got to the point where like, well, you're going to shoot this kind of scenes or you're not going to get it work. I was like, fine. Um, were you ever on the fence about performing in them? Um, in the beginning, my very first actual stepmother type work was um, a custom video that I did for a fan. Um, I have it in my notes. Hold on. I can never remember dates. So it was a custom video that I did with a fan uh, with Christy Mack. It was my stepdaughter's, uh, my rebellious, rebellious stepdaughter. Um, I think that was in 2000. Yeah, 2012. It was weird because Christy Mack and myself were very similar in age and I was playing her stepmother. So it just it felt weird because it's like, how could I be a stepmom to somebody that's like my same age? She was only like five years younger than I was. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's step. And we back in that day, like saying step was like not as strong as we have to say it now. Uh, so when I'm like, Saying my daughter was okay, but when she would call me mommy, it would like weird, like I would get this tingle down the back of my neck. And I started like diving into it, reading a lot more about it um, after the fan, um, really loved the content. And we posted it on one of our websites on Bareback Studios. And we just got like this flood of comments about how much they loved the video and we needed to do more of this. So I started diving in and I saw it more like how I see everything. It's a job and I'm an actor or an actress role playing this role of a stepmother or even a mother at that time. And just providing a, a uh, comforting thing because a lot of ours were more on the comforting side. So I was providing a comforting thing that maybe they didn't have when they were a child with their own mother or stepmother or uh, something that they yearned for growing up. Maybe not necessarily incorporating sex with it, but they were definitely seeking some sort of approval from their stepmother. So the more I dug in, the more I realized that there are deep seated things that had gone on that, I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's like, it just, I learned more about each of the fetishes that I've done that it kind of separates me. And I, I just come to terms that I'm playing a role and that it isn't really real. It's just fantasy. And in, in, in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah. I want to actually read, um, I, I never do this, but I thought this was a really interesting insight. I want to read a comment from one of my viewers on my YouTube channel. Um, when in a previous podcast, we were talking about the faux stuff and the stepmom scenes, et cetera. And like why, why they're so popular. And so this person, uh, honored mule wrote, I suspect the family tropes are arising from increased social isolation. 
in my day as a child, it was the teacher or the girl next door because those people were just beyond reach. At the range, we could see and desire, but not touch. They also tended to be more mature and elegant than accessible peers. Enter the smartphone and hyper-protective parenting, and children of today end up with smaller, real social circles, less human contact, and shrinking physical borders, all alongside the increased incidence of blended families. Now you have people who are just outside your reach, whose very presence isn't normalized from birth, yet are placed right in the same house as you, often without third-party supervision. And chances are the older family member got there by being sexually desirable to your previously single parent. The fantasy makes sense to me is one of opportunity for the sexually repressed. I thought that was an interesting take. I hadn't really thought about, um, you know, the, the idea of the social isolation. I, why can I not say that word? Isolation. (laughs) The social isolation. Wow. Again, Apologies to everybody listening. I didn't get home from set yesterday until midnight. I'm tired. So my mouth is not working very well today. Uh, But yeah, I just thought that was an interesting idea because I hadn't considered that. Because it is true. Like we are kind of becoming more insular. We are, our, our social circles are smaller. We don't like necessarily know our neighbors. Um, You know, we, we are becoming like more, you know, it's kind of that, the, the irony of we're more connected now than ever with smartphones and the internet yet, like we're more isolated as well, which I feel is why content platforms like OnlyFans, et cetera, where fans can access their favorite porn star and interact with her on a one-on-one basis. The explosion of that, I feel like really shows, I don't know, there's like a, a, pandemic of loneliness kind of do you do you see that at all yeah yeah for sure like and we're and our willingness our willingness to go along with whatever story they may have or whatever problems that they're dealing with we're the ones that are there to help them kind of maybe even just talk through it themselves just an outlet to where they can express their feelings and then be done. Like there's no real true connection, which I'm noticing this pop up more with that free use porn where there's a disconnect from both parties within the, the porn. So Mm -hmm. the free use and the step it's like, I'm getting what I'm getting out of it as a stepmom and the stepson is getting what he's getting out of it, but we're not really interacting with each other during the scene, which is very odd for me because I talk a lot um, in my scenes. So I'm trying to allow the viewer to understand what I'm going through throughout the scene. So I verbally promote that. And with this free use, it's almost like I just continue to do laundry while my stepson has his way with me. But it's Mm -hmm. not really he's having his way with me because I'm consenting to it as well. And it's a whole new genre of of porn that's been out there that I've been shooting recently. So explain to me the free use genre, because I actually have never heard that term before. What do you mean specifically by that? Um, from my gathering of just trying to pull information, it's a Japanese based like porn. Mm -hmm. Now my free use is different than their free use. Like my free use is we establish rules, um, within the household, if you will. Um, and you kind of, you ask and you can get which I guess, if anything, I mean, in this world, if you ask, you're going to get an answer of whatever you want. But in this fantasy world, you're getting exactly what you want. But we're Mm -hmm. allowed to connect with each other and um, respond to the actions that each of us are doing. Uh, So I can react to the sex that I'm having 
I can orgasm. Whereas some of this free use porn from Japan, the rules are established that you're pretty much allowed to do whatever you want to do. But like I was saying, like the laundry situation, I'm wearing a shirt or a skirt with no panties on. My stepson comes up to me and he has a heart on. Um, I just kind of lift up my skirt, show him that I don't have any panties. That means I'm ready for sex. It's kind of mm-hmm. this un, um, like you don't, the, the, the consent guidelines or the consent is really shaded, but mm-hmm. like there's no verbal consent. It's all just mm-hmm. done on action. So I don't know mm-hmm. if it has to do with how isolated we've become and uh, a fan is just jerking off or using a toy in his home. And then we're doing our thing over here. And that isolation has caused um, the lack of responses to different things, because I don't really know what the person is doing on the other side of the camera and vice versa. They don't really know what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. So it's like, it's very, very odd porn that I think it has been a little more unsettling for me than maybe the step family thing. Because Because like there's a kind of disconnect between the performers and the. Yeah. And it's literally a disconnect. Like I cannot react to the sex that I'm having. Like I can't verbally like orgasm i'm like sitting on the phone talking to my husband while my stepson is fucking me but i can't react to that sex interesting and do you see this coming into play a lot with like this whole stuck porn genre thing that we're doing like i'm stuck Mm -hmm. in the washing machine i'm stuck under the table um do you see that that is that kind of those two Uh, genres com- combine there. Yeah, but then you're you're still able to react to what's going on. You're stuck. It's a situation. Your um your your fear, fright and flight kind of gets activated because you're like, "Oh my god, I don't know if I can get out of this." And then somebody's helping you and they get excited. And you're excited and it kind of helps intensify maybe um, the excitement that the two of you are feeling. So I understand that. Um, But it's just, I don't know. So it's actually the opposite then because there is a lot more interaction because they're trying to help you get out of your sex situation and then they can't. And then they're like, oh, well while we're here <laughs> what's the what's the weirdest stuck scene you've ever filmed the weirdest stuck scene we did i got stuck in almost everything i've been stuck in almost everything and we were running out of places for me to get stuck so we came up um with this little bit and we kind of done some of this in the early years where we had these nanobots that got um, consumed by somebody and they would do a mind control thing in our videos. And then you couldn't do any mind control or hypnosis. So I'm like, why can't we do stuck where I literally get stuck to something with glue? So we made MILF glue and it was just, it's just glue, but I would put the MILF glue on my hands And my stepson or even my husband would say, hey, I'm coming up with this new um, this new stuff and it'll make you horny. But there's a side effect and we would use it. And then like my hands would just get stuck to the wall or stuck to a desk or stuck to my own body where I was like my hands were on my knees and I couldn't move them. And then the orgasm is what makes it unstuck. (laughs) <laughs> wow. That's interesting. That's definitely getting creative. Um, you also have a production studio for custom videos. What is the, 
let's say, most interesting custom video request you've ever received? The most interesting, like I get weird ones. It's all the the super weird, like the illegal stuff that you just can't do, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the vor things, like being eaten by an inanimate object, like a couch or the the bed, the mattress, I would get slide myself underneath the mattress in the box spring, or the closet would suck me in. Um, those were really weird. And it and it's almost like that damsel in distress mm-hmm. and the struggle of fighting is um, to break yourself free from being stuck <laughs> mm-hmm. um, is the the orgasm. You're not having sex. You're not masturbating. You're just being consumed. And I guess mm-hmm. used as satisfaction for somebody, something, somebody else. Interesting. They, so, they okay, all so have we- ties together. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of... Um- I mean, I feel like there's a lot of like sexual repression going on here, you know, like this, this whole, I mean, obviously it's consensual, but there's, there's some like kind of strange consensual, non-consensual stuff going on here. So let's say for the the bed consuming you. So how would you shoot that video? Would you start where like maybe, I mean, would you do some, like in my head, I'm imagining you're making a bed or something. And Mm -hmm. you put your hand under the mattress to like slide the sheets under and then your hand gets stuck and you can't get out and you're like, oh no. And then do you cut the camera and then it like jump cuts to like your arms are in the mattress? No, you can just slide slide more and more in. You just slide more and more in. And then there's some places like you do have to cut, but yeah, you'd be surprised at how well you can like slide yourself in. And I kind of, it's the weirdest thing. Like I felt like I was a kid again, like playing, like imaginary playing with a lot of these customs my fans send me. Like that's what I'm so super excited about because I could just use my imagination and come up with all these little scenarios. And it's like being a kid again. Yeah. God, it's so interesting. Um. Back in 2017, you became part of a media frenzy when Ted Cruz liked a tweet of you in a film called Dick for Two shortly after crusading against porn stars. How did you hear the news that this had happened and what was your reaction? I didn't really hear much about it while it was happening. It was a few days later. Uh, I was dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Irma it hit our mm-hmm. area and I didn't have power. Um, I think we had cell service, but I just did not have power. So I lost the battery on my phone. Um, and we went somewhere to pick up some water, I think for, uh, to drink and they had a charging station. So I plugged my phone in, I charged up my phone and when I turned it on, I had hundreds of voicemails of people trying to get a hold of me. I popped on my Twitter and Twitter pretty much said, you need to put filters on your mentions because there's too many. So I started digging and this is like, like days. I want to say it's like three days later after this happened. Um, It, it was just, it had already kind of like blown out by Mm -hmm. the time I got into it. So it, it was kind of disappointing that I didn't, and I didn't have any PR people at the time to help with any of that promotion work. Um, I got hundreds and hundreds of uh, reporters calling me and they're like, well, what did you think about Ted Cruz liking one of your videos? And it was, it was one, I hated that it was a pirated video on some tube site. Um, back yeah, then, I was kind of against Pornhub, which I didn't mm-hmm. understand that Pornhub and Reality Kings were pretty much the same thing. Uh, there was uh, 
the the part like where he was against porn stars he's against porn uh toys he's against masturbation that you shouldn't masturbate or diddle your private parts for pleasure other than pro procreating and and going to the doctor and getting it examined but i uh, i don't know it like and then he has to blame it on one of his staffers i just it, it was all just a weird very weird experience <laughs> yeah <I'm> sure <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, just another example of those who crusade like the hardest against porn are generally like some of its biggest consumers. It's just so frustrating because we have so much, you know, negative PR around our industry and so many people like fighting to ban porn and, and, and all that. But like everybody watches it, like everybody does. And it's just yeah, like, it's oh human God. nature. Yeah. It's just, Oh God. So frustrating. Um, you've been with your husband for over 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. you've said in interviews that you don't have much sex off camera. Uh, why is that? Uh, because there's not a whole lot of time left. <laughs> Cause you have so much uh, so sex on camera. <laughs> yeah. They, they call it a money shot for a reason. So mm -hmm. when my husband's a performer and I'm a performer, granted, um, my performances can be faked, if you will, a little bit easier than his. Uh, and I do enjoy facials in my videos. So the bigger the cum shot, the more I can swallow. Um, I enjoy it. And it is the money shot. It's what we're kind of known for. Um, Luke, my husband, he was a big Peter North fan. So he liked those ropes that he would throw on a girl's face or on her chest. And for porn, that's what I kind of grew up watching, grew up watching, mm -hmm. um, was like Peter North and like facials and like, I guess, Bukaki scenes, which mm -hmm. I'm just now realizing <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe why I have the uh, cum fetish that I do. So we shoot two to three times a week um, for our own productions, depending on models um, that we might have. And then we're shooting content for my OnlyFans. And then we're also shooting uh, custom work. So once you start adding all those hours up, on top of working out and cleaning house and cooking food and grocery shopping that you really don't have any more time in the day yeah. <laughs> to do anything else. And you're exhausted at the end of the day that you really just want to lay in your pool, enjoy yourself and go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. I relate. Definitely. I mean, I don't shoot scenes with my husband or shoot sex scenes at all, but I have a child and I have a full-time job. So <laughs> I get the whole, like, very tired at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so does your husband also work with other performers as well, or does he only work with you? He works with other performers for our own content, uh, for our own uh, website. He doesn't work for other production companies. He's pretty much just stuck to us. Because working mm -hmm. two to three days out of the week um, is... I mean, really all he's willing to do, uh, yeah. for our own stuff. You got to space out those, those cum shots. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you want to throw Peter North ropes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so is there ever, because, you know, there's always one of the questions that I see so often from my audience is how do people in porn have relationships with each other? How can you be married and still have sex with other people? You know, um, how can you be in a committed relationship? What does a committed relationship mean? How do you, how would you answer those questions? Uh, so we were dating, um, for a couple of years and we kind of dabbled in some swinger lifestyle. I found out that I liked being recorded, um, during sex that it was a turn on. Uh, so 
like all those things kind of led to where we are now. But then that kind of backstory, like behind the scenes is a lot of communication. There's always got to be an open communication between you and your partner and understanding what kind of relationship you're having with your sex partner. If there is any kind of relationship at all, or if it was just a notch on the belt type of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So like communication, it has always been the biggest key because we've, we've dabbled into having side boyfriends and side girlfriends and they always come and go and they get tired or they're out like doing things on their own and they just, we kind of just separate from each other, the the side pieces, if you will. Um, But then our marriage and our relationship with me and my husband is that constant that is always there. We know we always have um, each other to fall back on. Yeah, that makes sense. Corey, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really interesting. Um, I'm glad that we got into everything from military service to life after death, uh, to being eaten by your bed for custom videos. (laughs) This is truly, I feel like this interview is just big wide spectrum of topics and it's been really great. Um, can you let everybody know where they can find you online? Um, Plug all your social medias, your OnlyFans, all that stuff. Okay, so you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Corey Chase Triple X. I no longer have an Instagram account. Pretty much done with Instagram. Um, I'm also on OnlyFans, Corey Chase Triple X as well. You can um, sign up to tabooheat.com where all of our content is. And then I have textcoreychase.com is kind of my kind of uh, landing page, if you will, because I've been taken advantage of many times over the years and I've lost a lot of URLs um, that I wish I could have held on to. So textcoreychase.com is like my catch-all link and definitely tabooheat.com is where it's at. Fantastic. And you guys can find me on Instagram and on Twitter, um, at Holly Randall. I also have an OnlyFans, onlyfans.com slash Holly Randall. I'm on TikTok for now. I say that every time because I'm so close to being deleted. <laughs> Holly Randall and filtered. And of course, if you want to support this podcast, get access to early releases of remote recordings like this one, or watch my in-person interviews live. Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining me and I'll see you next week.